standing here, you can see that the water level is very low. And this, of course, is low tide. And I'm just saying that it's midday. I'm being a bit simplistic in that I'm giving you the idea that you have two tides in 24 hours, which is not strictly accurate, but it's enough to, to illustrate the point. And, of course, as the earth rotates, he moves round about 6 o'clock in the, in the evening to a bit of the earth where the water levels are very high. And, of course, this is high tide. And then, given another six hours, he's back to low tide again at midnight, and then he goes eventually back to where he started from. And so, roughly in 24 hours, you have two low tides and two high tides. Now, you might wonder why I'm making such a big deal of the tide. And I want to preempt a question because it's a question which I anticipate people asking. And it's a question, doesn't the sun cause the tides? And the answer is, it contributes to the tides, but it's not the major factor. And I want to, uh, to illustrate what this is about. So here we have the sun on the, the upper right. Again, we have the earth. And the sun does exert a pull on the earth. And if the moon is aligned with the sun, so the, if you draw a line, you can actually draw a line through the earth, the moon and the sun, you get a very, very high tide. And this, of course, is what we call a spring tide. And you get them once, well, I was going to say once a month, but once every 28 days. But I, when the moon is either waxing or waning, and it's a half moon, so it's at right angles, what happens then is you can see that the tide facing the sun is less than the tide facing the moon. You see that? Right? And that's a very good illustration of the fact that it's the moon that is the principal draw of the tide and not the sun. But when you have this situation where the moon's at right angles to the sun, you have the neap tide. And this is where the high tide is not very high and the low tide is not very low. Whereas a spring tide, the high tide is very high and the low tide is very low. And we find it very interesting as kids when we were down in Guruk, we, I come from Guruk, because if you have a spring tide combined with a storm, we used to go down to the shore and see all the yachts wrecked on the beach. That was our entertainment as kids. The people who owned the yachts didn't appreciate our fascination by it. Now, why are the tides so important? Well, one thing you've got to, to remember is that the surface of the ocean, first of all, I should point out, of course, that the ocean forms by far the biggest surface area of the planet. It's much bigger than the landmass. And the surface of the ocean contains small, single-celled plants. And these plants, of course, are busy fixing oxygen and producing carbon dioxide. And they make a major contribution to the balance of oxygen and carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And if they were wiped out for some reason, the balance would be completely lost and you'd land up in a situation where there was much, much more carbon dioxide than what we have today. I mean, it would be global warming run completely mad. <coughs> now, the other thing to remember is, of course, that people are thinking, well, what about the trees, the Amazon rainforest? And that's very, very true. But an aspect of it you've got to remember is that it's a relatively small land mass that can be inhabited by plants. So you go above something like, say, 10,000 feet, it gets so cold that there's very little doing on the, the plant kingdom. So the ocean is making a major contribution to the, the levels of oxygen and the removal of carbon dioxide. Now, the tide is important because the nutrients needed to supply these plants would lie at the bottom of the ocean. And you have to continually stir up the ocean and create currents in it to flush these nutrients to the surface, and by doing so, feeding the plants that are on the surface. And the tides are one of the major contributors to this flushing. There are, of course, ocean currents, etc., but tides are, have a very significant role. Now, moving on a little bit, I, I, I hesitate to talk about weather, particularly because I'm from the west coast of Scotland, and weather in the west coast is very predictable. We have a saying in Greenock that if it's not raining, it's because it just has been and it's just about to. <laughs> now, although I give Greenock a, a severe slagging, um, one thing you will probably be very well aware of is the whole business of the Gulf Stream passing up the west coast of Scotland 
making a profound change on our weather in that we never really have any bad winters and we never really have any incredibly hot summers. That's not the case on the East Coast, is it? Uh -huh. That's another wee joke. Right. Um, and the Gulf Stream is a major ocean current, and I don't want to go down the whole line of it, but it's an illustration that the movements of the ocean have an, have an impact upon the weather and therefore upon life itself. Now, the question one would ask is, if you consider the possibility of the moon being larger than what it is, or a little bit closer to the Earth, what would the impact of that be upon our planet? And the answer would be that the tides would be higher than what we see today. Now, we're aware of the business of global warming, that if we have an increase of something like 20 metres of water, it would be catastrophic for much of the land surface, because a lot of the land which is arable, which we actually use, would be flooded. And this is exactly the scenario which we would have in a slightly larger moon, or being slightly closer. And, of course, the larger and closer it came, the worse the catastrophe would be, until eventually there was virtually no land mass that would be inhabitable because of that. Likewise, if the moon was actually slightly further away, or smaller, the reverse would be the case, where the tides would become so small that it's questionable if there would be enough movement of water to bring the nutrients flush to the surface and to maintain the small plants living on the surface of the oceans. So the distance which the moon is from our planet and the size of the moon relative to us has a profound impact upon life on our planet. Moving away from the moon, I want to then consider how the Earth actually orbits around the sun. And before I actually talk about that in great detail, I think one thing I really have to point out is how critical it is where our planet is relative to the sun. Now there we have the sun in the centre and we have the Earth buzzing around the outside in an orbit. Ignore this bit here, this is just a little bit of um, background to, to enhance the picture. Now, if you do a very simplistic diagram where you've got the sun sitting in the centre and, of course, the Earth is orbiting round the sun, and we consider the Earth in this position on the right-hand side. And what I want you to notice is that at this position, the North Pole is facing towards the sun and the South Pole is facing away. Now, this would be our summer, where we're spending much of our day in daylight whereas the South Pole are having their winter, where much of their day is actually being spent in darkness. And, of course, we are aware that the further north or south you go, the more dramatic the impact is, that the temperatures drop and the daylight gets less. And, of course, the opposite is true when we're on the other side. This is something like, what, 170 days later, where it would be our winter, where we're in the North Pole, we're mostly in darkness, whereas those in the South Pole are enjoying their summer. Now... The reason why I'm, I'm saying this is that you've got a very small change in the distance of the Earth, or should I say the distance of the pole from the Sun, and yet we are very much aware of the impact that has on our weather. Now, you've got a much greater scenario than that, and it's this, that the Earth has an almost perfect circular orbit around the Sun. Now, that is not normal. That is actually unusual. It's relatively unique. It's not completely unique, but it's relatively unique. That if you look at planets orbiting around suns in other galaxies, you'll find that most of them have an elliptical orbit. Now, that has a profound impact upon whether or not you have life. And the reason for that is that if you have an elliptical orbit, at this point here, you're significantly closer to the sun and at this point here, you're significantly further away than if you were in a circular orbit. Now, they reckon that the tolerance levels is something like 2.5%. And what they mean by that is that if we're 2.5% nearer to the sun, the temperature goes beyond 100 degrees centigrade and you lose all the water. And that means that there's no life possible on the planet. So, at this point of the ellipse where you're close to the sun, you've boiled off all the water and you've eliminated life. At this point here, you're so far away from the sun that you're deeply frozen. And, of course, if you go well below zero degrees centigrade, there are some creatures that can survive fairly low temperatures, but the vast majority of life would not be able to survive in these conditions. So that the Earth has a circular orbit 
plays a major role on